and and we'll start uh, now. Good evening. I'm Alex Trianis, Dean of the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our Distinguished Speaker Series, in which we discuss today's most compelling business challenges with most accomplished business professionals. This evening, we're pleased to have with us Will Fuller, President and CEO of Transamerica Corporation, one of the nation's largest insurers. The company serves millions of customers throughout the US and Canada with approximately $500 billion in assets across its core businesses of life insurance, annuities, retirement plans, asset management, and employee benefit. Throughout Will's nearly 30 year career in financial services, he has worked relentlessly to help consumers and their families achieve a lifetime of financial security. He was appointed president and CEO of Transamerica Corporation in March, 2021. He's also chairman of the America's Management Board and a member of the Transamerica Corporation Board of Directors and the Management Board of Agent um, Transamerica's parent company, Agon. Uh, prior to joining Transamerica, Will served in senior leadership roles for Lincoln Financial Group and Merrill Lynch. He was also actively engaged in the formation of the Alliance for Lifetime Income and served as chairman of the operating committee. Will is a member of the board of the American Council of Life Insurers and formerly served as board member of LL Global Incorporated, a Forum for Investor Advice, Money Management Institute and Insured Retirement Institute, which honored him with his 2019 Industry Champion of Financial Security Award, as well as his 2014 Leadership Award. So Will, it's wonderful to have you with us this evening. Uh, welcome to Cary Business School. Hello, Alex. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here with you. Well, great. I will start us off with a few uh, questions, but we're also anxious to hear from our audience. And so um, just for the audience members, if you want to ask a question, please use the Zoom Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any point, and we'll pick up on some of those questions as, as we go along. So, Will, one of the um, questions that I always enjoy um, and learn a lot um, talking to, to leaders, CEOs such as yourself is just to understand the impact that the uh, pandemic um, uh, had on your, on your company. And, and obviously, as I mentioned, you took over uh, Transamerica in March, 2021, uh, right in the middle. So if you could just give us a sense for maybe what it was like uh, joining in the middle of the pandemic and also how you saw the pandemic impacting uh, Transamerica's um, business. Yeah, absolutely, Alex. I think it's a really relevant question to start. So uh, I think everybody has a, a, a sense of what it feels like to have a first day at work or a first day of school. And you're, um, you know, you're coming in, you've got the butterflies in the, you know, in the tummy uh, about, you know, the new job, if you will. Um, and but you quickly get immersed in the in the company and get immersed with your new teammates or your new classmates. And one of the challenges of the pandemic is you didn't have that natural cycle, right? So you were essentially, and I was having to experience uh, leading a company uh, as CEO uh, virtually. We were not in the office. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to 
uh, engage with my colleagues in person in the same way that you normally would. And then to make matters worse, we're in a, or make matters more challenging, we're a company that's in uh, the midst of a transformational strategy, right? So we're trying to change the strategic direction of the company. And so um, being able to return to be in person and get to meet uh, my teammates and colleagues um, uh, has, has, has been wonderful. But I, I think we are, in our industry, very um, uh, grateful that we have the opportunity to perform um, the major activities of operating an insurance company, we actually can do it virtually. Um, and so we feel again, very thankful. We know there are a lot of business models and industries that aren't able to be able to shift to working virtually and deal, you know, while you're dealing with the challenges of uh, working virtually, you're able to perform the basic activities of, uh, of your company. Actually, you know, what, what, what we found is very effectively. Um, but I think one of the takeaways first is, I believe personally that it accelerated the adoption of virtual work, digital adoption, and flexible work by at least a decade. Um, and so I see nothing but positivity in the ability that as, uh, as an industry, we spent two years perfecting as best we can, how to use these new technologies that allow us to connect um, and learn how to weave in flexibility, um, work arrangements, uh, flexible um, locations, flexible scheduling um, in a way that I think is, you know, long term going to allow us to, um, you know, to to really to really thrive. And then lastly, I saw behaviors change. Um, two in particular, um, uh, I started to see just a tremendous amount of empathy that people were displaying to one another, the colleagues, you know, you, the dog would jump up in the lap or a child would run through a room interrupting a board meeting and everybody would give a little chuckle. And it was, you know, nice to see um, um, that it, um, you know, you didn't have to have this super serious um, um, model all the time and I brought a little lightness to it. And then I also see uh, people are much more self-sufficient in how they operate at work, um, how they're able to use their technology. So um, that, that's been interesting. I've kind of seen some of the hierarchical elements in a company break down a bit. Uh, People interact a little bit more. Session talking about <laughs> pandemic lessons, so but those are just a, a few off the top of my head. Well, thanks, Juan. It's interesting. Um, you know, we one of the things that we all always note in terms of um, the, the virtual work is is what it's like to onboard new employees. Yeah. Uh, so you, you you've had to deal with that probably onboarding some employees that start after you, but but also you yourself um, had to be onboarded. Uh, virtually, I imagine to to a great extent. How do you uh, how do you see sort of keeping a culture really strong? It sounds like like you found opportunities actually to find um, greater opportunities to create that empathy and connections. Do you feel that um, we can continue to keep uh, strong cultures, or do we have to sort of go to greater lengths to make sure that we can um, keep that culture as strong as possible? Yeah, I I, I think it's finding the right mix of of how do we virtual with in person? Um, I don't think anyone has figured out the code. Um, there is an, an ongoing kind of strategic question, which is, you know, how do you build long term culture if everyone's not in the office? Um, at the same time, I would say you've got a dilemma. How do you hold on to the best talent if you don't offer flexibility? So I really think it's it's worthy of leadership teams and. Um, um, and I'd say all colleagues to communicate and find ways to to bring that culture. But, you know, you, you can demonstrate that culture every day um, by reinforcing in your in your virtual calls the tenets of that culture. And the, the, there, there's kind of three ways we talk about it. Transamerica, which is our behaviors are we tune in, we step up and we're a force for good. And so. Um, giving examples to the notion of tuning in. I tuned into my colleague, I'm tuning into my client to understand better what their needs, you know, we step up, right? We, um, 
you know, you know, you know, you know, stepping up to uh, contribute towards a goal could be anything uh, as a as a service challenge that you want to step up and engage, or a project that's gotten off track. And then I think the we're a force for good. So, um, which is all the ways we can kind of help our employees, help our society, uh, you know, um, help our communities, and and you know, using the repetition of our meetings as a way to put a voice and put examples to things like that, I think are helpful, but um, it's a journey that we're on as well. We don't have all the answers, it's, 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 but it's something we're keen to continue to work on. And when we talk about culture and as well as, as, as the other, uh, as, as well as productivity, uh, that we are all starting to rethink um, how we use our, our office space, right? And so you've got sort of home, the office, and the third spaces as, as well. Um, we're, we're very excited to have you all moving a little bit closer to our space in Harbor Point. I was wondering if you could say a few words about sort of that, that move from, um, from where your offices have been in Baltimore for a long time and uh, some of the advantages potentially to the new location, not just being close to us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, it's um, it's a beautiful part of the city to be right there on the harbor. We're moving our headquarters um, from Light Street uh, down to the Wills Wharf area. Um, the decision was made before I joined the company, so it has no relation to my name, Wills Wharf. <laughs> but um, it is a uh, it's a facility that we think is going to really facilitate um, hybrid and remote working. We'll have um, you know, pods and areas that allow, um, you know, colleagues to be together, but also connect um, with someone who's remote. We think that's important. We don't want it to be exclusionary. We don't want the in-person work experience to exclude the individual or individuals, our colleagues that uh, for any matter of reason aren't in the office that day. So how you plan that technology that, that supports, uh, the, you know, teams that are working together uh, in co-locations, we think is um, we think is really important. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, we've been very clear that that will not be an office that exists for people to commute to every day. That is not the purpose of the workplace. The workplace serves a purpose, and that purpose is to achieve an objective. You know, networking, training, um, working through a very difficult or creative problem. But it doesn't exist for someone have to commute, uh, you know, five days a week. Um, and so uh, we've, you know, we're, we've adopted a, 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 a manner of working that uh, will lead to probably somewhere between, you know, one to three days in the office, depends on the function that you have, depends on the, the team. And uh, what that's done is, is it's allowed us to uh, shrink our space, our real estate footprint across the country. Um, and so we've been able to shrink our foot, footprint of real estate by about 30 percent um, because we're reflecting the fact that, you know, um, most of our employees will be working in a hybrid format. Great. Well, one one of the uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, one of the things I think that the last couple of years have um, created increased focus on is really, um, you, you know, sort of the, the life work. Uh, balance and and frankly, a lot of um, people have started to think a little bit more about their retirement, which is something that um, you not only have thought a lot about, but I know, as I noted earlier, you received several awards for your commitment to improving retirement security through advocacy, um, communication, and education. Um, what does what does a meaningful retirement um, mean for retirees today, and and what what do you think it will mean for future generations? So just your general thoughts yes. on retirement. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think it's it's a very different retirement um, than than those that uh, retired in the past. You know, it, 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 it's a retirement uh, in my belief that you, you might not ever retire. You might continue to change careers. You continue to change vocation and work a lot longer. And the reason for that is, I mean, longevity is one of the greatest, you know, blessings uh, uh, to human life. Someone born today in the Western world can expect to live um, to be over 100. And so this three-stage model of, you know, you get educated, then you go work, and then you retire, I think it's a very outdated notion. Um, I like to point to the Rolling Stones and Elton John, maybe as an example, these are people that are living their passion and 
uh, and still going at, still following their, their passion and their work, uh, you know, well into their 70s. So I think the way you prepare for that, both your wealth and your health is really important because the foundation that retirement was supported on was always a three-legged stool, right? It was your, it was your retirement pro uh, uh, program at work, generally a 401k, social security and your personal savings. We think that's just too simplistic of a, of a model when you think about uh, people could be outside of their main career uh, in retirement longer than they, um, um, than they were actively working. And you also look at the way people are uh, choosing to migrate their careers and have multiple chapters in their work. Um, you're seeing mobility increase as well. Um, my daughter is a senior in college. She graduates next week and she asked me the other day about uh, where she, her first, you know, where she was going to move after college. And I said, well, you know, don't really sweat that decision. You know, you're going to go to New York. That's where she wants to go. I said, you're going to go to New York. But remember, you're probably going to live five different places. So don't, don't pack so much of a, a pressure on that decision because, um, you know, more than likely you're going to be quite, quite, you're going to be quite a bit more mobile um, than I've been in my career. So I, I just find it fascinating to look at the, the sociology of it. Um, and uh, I think the financial services industry needs to really innovate to be able to be flexible, to, to help people prepare. And more importantly, as importantly, um, make sure underserved consumer groups, groups that are underserved by traditional financial services companies get access to education so they can have, uh, be empowered to make the best decisions, you know, with their, um, uh, with their money from the beginning, right? Which is thinking about um, getting, you know, um, um, you know, how they use their bank accounts, how they use um, lending, how they think about debt, as well as how they think about savings. All that goes together. The sooner you start uh, as a young person, the better off you'll be later in life. Well, and you mentioned education and, and obviously something that, that we are highly committed to. And, um, uh, and, and education with access to all. So I want to um, shift to talk a little bit about DEIB. And for those uh, in the audience who, who aren't aware, um, uh, the, the Transamerica through the Aegon Transamerica Foundation is a um, supporter of Cary Business School's Summer Business Academy, um, where we bring in um, students from HBCUs and give them a, a glimpse uh, for a few days at uh, the transformational power of, of a business education. And so we are very appreciative of that gift um, to be able to target underrepresented groups. So I thought it'd be um, a great opportunity to ask you a little bit about sort of why you all made that gift and, and how does DIB sort of uh, figure into your leadership and to everything that's going on at Transamerica? Well, I, I think, you know, we, we have a belief that as you're striving to accomplish great things and you're looking forward, you should reach back and bring people along with you. Um, just as a general principle, um, how we encourage our, our colleagues to help, help our colleagues uh, be successful work, but also help people uh, come into our industry um, and help people uh, move uh, their station in life up. I think all of us have a personal experience where someone or something gave us a, a shot um, or, 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 or a boost or simply just open the door just enough to, to be able to, in a sense, to walk through. So it's the sort of gift that I think is just very consistent with you know, our view of um, you know, the American experience and the ability to, um, uh, to help those that are less, less fortunate learn about uh, the opportunities and the potential that exist um, through education, um, and whether it leads them to our industry or to, uh, to others is, uh, um, we're very happy to do that. Uh, I think, um, in, in, in our, uh, approach, um, inside our company, and I, I you know, I think the, uh, as I look at, uh, your Ackerman, which is, you know, DEIB, the inclusion and belonging, I think is a really important factor, um, you know, the idea that the work that the, that the company where you work is a, is a place that's that's good for you it's a, a work that's workplace that's safe for you to be uh, to be yourself to be accepted 
um, is uh, is something that's just a really important um, you know aspect to, to to our company, um, you know, and and many others. Um, the uh, when you when you think about one aspect of our business um, is we have a passion for uh, finding ways to serve underrepresented consumers and finding ways to create career opportunities for others. We have a business um, called World Financial Group that does, that does exactly that. We have over 50,000 life insurance agents and 3,000 of them are registered um, uh, securities providers. And um, it's a highly diverse group where we have over you know, 20 different languages spoken, um, more than 50% represented by, um, by women, um, uh, a very large percentage, I believe over 30% people of color, nationalities uh, from all over the world. And it has created an opportunity for them to own their own business, own their own business in a sense, you know, take control of, uh, of their professional lives. And they then serve uh, customers and communities that aren't traditionally served by the banking or the insurance sector. So it has all sorts of different uh, um, programs, everything from, you know, how you recruit, uh, how you post positions, how you hire for positions, what's the interview process look like, um, your benefit programs, um, uh, the businesses and the customers and communities that, and, and, and communities that you serve. And so I think it's really about having a, a, a commitment to it. And then you get a portfolio of all sorts of different uh, ideas. Um, last point I'll make, Alex, is um, we have what's called employee resource groups. And we started with one employee resource group in 2012. We now have, like, we now have uh, uh, over 20 employee resource groups. 20% of our workforce participates in employee resource groups and they feed up ideas to the company about how we can improve our diversity, inclusion, engagement. Um, they feed up ideas about uh, how we might be able to contribute from, a, from our gifting programs through our foundation, like in uh, the program you just mentioned with, your, with, uh, with John Hopkins, but, but also other organiz worthy organizations uh, that might exist uh, nationally. So it's, you know, it's, um, it's pretty cool when you start to see all those portfolio of actions come together and, and, uh, and get momentum behind them. Absolutely. And, um, you know, your, your, your gift also supports not only scholarships, but mentorship. And it sounds like those, those groups uh, provide an opportunity to increase mentorship to really help uh, to lift up uh, talent from underrepresented groups within Transamerica. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. In fact, it's interesting that you mentioned the World Finance um, uh, Group because, in fact, we had a question about that. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, so it's clearly um, developed some visibility, and uh, thank you for the question on that. Um, I want to um, talk a little bit about um, ESG. Uh, it, it's become um, really such an important um, area or, or combination or cluster of areas where companies now have really changed in terms of um, their focus and, uh, and investors and, and businesses alike are focused, including on, on climate change, for instance. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how Transamerica is addressing ESG, um, both as a business and on behalf of its customers? Yeah, so ESG is, um, is, the, is the priority of the company, as, as, as you mentioned um, earlier, Alex, our parent company is Agon Group. And Agon, is a European-based company based in the Netherlands, and um, you know I think that um, you know the European companies, um, as a general statement, it's not always uh, the case, but I think in this case, it, as a general statement, European companies are have been a, a bit further ahead uh, on the ESG front, particularly in the area of, of climate change and the environment. Um, if you take that to mention for a second, uh, European companies have been uh, pretty far ahead. Of, uh, of U.S. companies, or at least the, uh, the U.S. companies um, that I've worked for. And I, I think it's been a real, real um, enjoyable experience. I lead, I, I, I chair the company's Global Sustainability Board. And uh, through that effort, we're looking at ways to um, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions um, to net zero by 2050, but we're looking to get a 25% reduction just in the next three years. Uh, particularly as we look at our um, our corporate debt and uh, and and enlisted equities, and so 
Uh, why is that important? Well, for everybody here on the call, insurance companies are long-term investors. Uh, we generally are purchasing long-term corporate debt and we're purchasing equity in companies as a part of our, uh, a part of our reserve. So I'm making our commitment to reduce our exposure um, to, um, uh, to carbon intense uh, assets is a, um, you know, is, is, is something that uh, we think will make a difference and in committing to net zero greenhouse emissions. We've also committed to reducing our carbon footprint, which is what's led to, uh, in part, the reduction of the square footage of real estate that I talked about that we had. So greater embracing the flexible work means you need less uh, square footage in the office means you've got less square footage to uh, heat and cool. Um, it means you've got less uh, commuting that's taking place. Um, we've made a commitment to reduce uh, travel, as an example. Um, so I think, you know, it's, again, it's just very similar to diversity and inclusion where you, you know, you, you set some targets, you set some aspirations, and you start getting a portfolio of uh, of different actions that can um, can all go towards uh, towards that goal. I would say one dynamic that I find um, I think a bit frustrating, um, and when I spend my time in in, in DC, we, uh, we we bring this up is there there really is a lack of a consistent framework and consistent standards for ESG, um, and that is uh, that's challenging, right? So. It's challenging for uh, business to really understand um, and rally around uh, what does those what is that standard or what does that priority mean? I think in um, in Europe in particular, there's a little more consistency uh, to that standard. But just as a as a point, I recently was in D.C. and we met with the Treasury Department, the Labor Department, the SEC, um, and a few other agencies, and notably. Each one of the agencies had ESG or climate at top of their list, and each of them were approaching it differently. So uh, I think we would be well served, uh, you know, in America to try to get some consistency uh, in standards. Um, I think that would help uh, both government and the private sector come together. Absolutely, and and in terms of um, areas in which you think our students should should get prepared, I guess for. Um, working in industry, um, it sounds like that would be sort of one key area is really to understand the accountab accountability measures, the various components of ESG. Is that any, any other thoughts on how to best prepare? Yeah, I think it's, it's um, you know, really understand the benefits of setting long-term aspirations, but then having realistic, measurable targets. Um, and when you go after structural change, you know, you're going to have to it, it, it being um, being committed to a strategy of consistency, right? So, commit to the aspiration, commit to the targets, and then really get consistent about that work. Um, you know, the notion that you know every couple of years you change your strategy, every couple of years you start changing your targets. I think it's uh, um, you start to uh, you start to lose momentum. But also asking tough questions: What are we really trying to do? Uh, are we trying to influence? You know, one reason why we are reducing the um, uh, investments in carbon intensity uh, companies is because we want to be able to influence uh, those companies to continue to um, to find ways to become um, um, uh, less carbon intensive. If we simply got out of them immediately, we would lose a seat at the table right. and being, quote unquote, as I said earlier, stepping up and being a force for good. So really important to weave together not only your aspirations, but your, um, your principles, your public policies, your targets, and, um, and then get involved. Most companies are going to form uh, an, um, a group that's going to help um, provide advice and guidance and, uh, and, and, and such to management. You know, speak up and get involved um, and, um, and, again, become a force for good. Exactly. Well, you, you've said a fair bit about the environmental piece, um, just in terms of the of the S in ESG, the social piece. Uh, we did yeah. have a question that came in from the audience, um, which asked about which asked um, what has Transamerica done to address 
um, income inequality. So any, any thoughts in terms of that particular aspect of um, equality issues? Yeah, it's a, it, it, it's a really good question. So um, there's a few things that, that we do as a company um, that kind of gets at um, uh, income inequality. Um, but one is an actually pretty exciting initiative that was just announced this week from uh, the life insurance industry, um, which is the formation of a nonprofit that is financed by our industry that invests in um, low income um, communities, particularly to create affordable housing, uh, as well as um, to increase standards of living in those communities. Life insurance companies, as I said earlier, were one of the largest investors uh, in long-term assets and things like mortgages and things like real estate. So being able to take the billions of dollars that we put to work and to you know, carve out a focus on being able to invest them into low-income areas to improve conditions and standard of living is a good example of doing that. Uh, the industry is committed to this. As a company, um, we have kind of long had a emphasis on uh, affordable housing. So we've got a, as, or had, have had for years as a part of our um, uh, investment approach, affordable housing as a place where we prioritize, um, you know, where, where we put our capital. I think that's just, you know, that's an example. Uh, other examples are through our foundation, um, you know, making gifts and making grants uh, to organizations that, you know, are really close to the ground um, to help uh, uh, people in communities. I think your your scholarship uh, is um, is a very small example of the of the sort of focus that we would make uh, through our foundation. Great. Well, you're you're talking about sort of innovative um, products. We also have a question here, which I'll I'll read. Um, as you pursue your new uh, strategic initiatives and overall strategy that you mentioned at the top of the call, uh, what lines of business does Transamerica see as most strategic? And are there lines uh, that you would move away from? Um, <laughs> and, and regarding the second, and, and this gets a little bit technical, so you may have to help us here. If so, how do you plan on using reinsurance to reduce legacy books slash runoff? Yeah, great question. So uh, the first thing that we did in our transformation is to, is to separate um, what we call financial assets from strategic assets. Strategic assets are the market segments we want to grow, the businesses that we want to grow. Financial assets are legacy businesses that we no longer want to grow. We're going to wall them off and manage them as a closed block. Let me come back to that because that's the lady or gentleman second part of their question on reinsurance. Um, so strategic assets are areas that we want to grow. They have dynamics to them that we deem to be attractive. Um, number one, they would have lower risk profiles. They'd be less capital intensive. Um, there'd be a very, there could be a very large demographic opportunity that's unmet. Um, they could be solutions that aren't as uh, sensitive to capital market sensitivities, um, things like low interest rates or volatile equity markets. And so if I look at through the businesses that we, that, we re, that we want to grow, they want to be in the area of retirement plans. So we're, one, we're a company that's one of the best positioned companies to serve small and medium-sized employers in, um, in their retirement plans. 401ks, they provide them in, you know, it, um, to, 401ks they provide to their employers, employees rather. Um, employee benefits would also be benefits that people would uh, draw upon at work. Uh, things like hospital indemnity and uh, critical illness, um, you know, benefits that go very well with uh, a high deductible medical plan. Then there's individual life insurance, uh, there's annuities, and, uh, and mutual funds. So those would be the businesses in the sense that we want to grow. They're ones that have long been under the Transamerica banner and brand uh, that's well known uh, in the marketplace for those businesses. The latter part of the question, one that was pretty technical, I thought was, was is, is actually very relevant, is, is we've essentially walled off the businesses that we would deem to be financial. These would be legacy books of business where we're managing the risk. And this is where reinsurance uh, comes into play. Um, we may have a book of called variable annuity living benefit business or long-term care as an example that are very capital intensive, uh, particularly as a public company. 
while carry with it a risk profile that needs to be managed. And, um, you know, one way that you can think about that is risk transfer it to a reinsurer. You take the risk from your balance sheet, you transfer it to a reinsurer, and in some cases it releases the capital that you're holding and allowing you to invest into those growth businesses, those strategic assets. So reinsurance is something that, you know, I've deployed in my career um, in a variety of different ways. Um, it really just means you're transferring risk that you have to a counterparty and in return, getting some form of capital benefits that you can redeploy uh, for other purposes. You could use it to grow other businesses. Um, you could use it to return that capital to shareholders, a whole host of reasons why you might do that. Uh, great, so that um, the sort of gives us a sense of the innovativeness of your product lines and how you're sort of recalibrating the portfolio. Um, there's also a, a lot of innovation going on right now in financial services um, related to technology. So I, I'm curious sort of what, what your take is in terms of how you all are seizing these opportunities. Yeah, technology transformed the insurance. It transformed financial services. Um, we've talked about a way it can transform the way that you can participate as a, you know, as a colleague in the workforce, right? Um, um, it has uh, allowing technology allows us to manage risk. We're, we're, we're in the risk management business. It allows us to manage uh, risk in a more precise and effective way. And uh, the ability to do that means you can be more precise about what the actual cost of that risk is, right? So it allows protection to be purchased on a much more affordable basis uh, than it would have when uh, you're operating with... Um, you know, without the powerful analytics um, that we have. And an example that, uh, of that is um, we have the ability to see and predict um, how you know, insurance in a lot of ways is based off of the law of large numbers um, and then also the behavior, individual behavior, individual choices that they make. So large, in law of large numbers, if a lot of people buy you know, um, a variable annuity with a lifetime guaranteed income, then you can spread the risk over that population, easy enough concept. But now the utilization of that benefit, that's really where the risk is. And so the ability to have technology that feeds analytics that allows us to see the, the emergence of different trends between gender, between age, between the tax status of the account, between the structure of the account between certain regions of the country gives us a more precise sense of what our behavior will be. We can price that in a much more affordable way. A lot of times we're taking risk that is impacted by capital markets, equity markets up, equity markets down, uh, volatility, um, you know, interest rates. Well, as an institution, we're able to hedge that risk out. Um, we have a Transamerica, we have a $50 billion notional value a hedging program uh, that's essentially operated by a supercomputer, right? So you're talking about a massive amount of, uh, of Delta hedging that, that, that hedges our economic risk exposure, thereby, thereby allowing us to offer guarantees and protections that without that dynamic hedging program, you would not have a, a product or a solution created for uh, a consumer um, to, um, uh, to have access to. And, and, and you see a lot of those solutions come out in, you know, uh, mass affluent, um, you know, mass market retirement products and things like that. Um, ease of doing business, the ability to have someone sitting in their home be able to execute a very complex transaction through DocuSign is an example. And I think the advent of um, uh, technology startups that are looking to serve and reach consumers in different ways than traditional companies, and you see that uh, through fintechs. I think those are all all very positive uh, for um, for our industry and the customers we serve. Yeah, well, it's it's um, as you said in terms of uh, how how easy it's become for customers to interface, and as you said, also the um, the pricing becoming. Um, getting passed down to, to the consumer. The, these are incredible um, innovations. You, you mentioned interest rates and um, talking a lot about hedging. Uh, not surprisingly, we have a question about inflation. So you can, you can yeah. tell us a little bit about inflation and interest rates. But the question is, how has inflation influenced the company's investment strategies? 
and what economic indicators um, must factor into decision making. But maybe you can also just talk more generally about sort of what higher interest rate environment means for your industry. Well, for, for an industry that's seen interest rates go nothing but down to persistent low levels for the last couple of decades, um, increases in interest rates for the insurance industry is a, is a very clear positive, right? For our business, it's a very clear positive. Um, we are a very simple business. We take in premiums, we invest them, we earn a spread, and then we essentially pay out benefits. So the ability when interest rates go up to invest and earn a higher spread uh, is actually um, a tailwind and a, and a benefit for us. It means that we can offer um, uh, certain products that are not able to be priced effectively at low interest rates. We can offer them again, um, particularly long-term guarantees. Uh, and we can offer them at, uh, we can offer products at a lower price because you can kind of think of interest rates as uh, akin to us as jet fuel would be to an airline, uh, except for us, the lower the interest rates, the more expensive in a, in a sense that is. So from when you talk to an insurance executive, they're, they're likely going to um, on balance be pretty happy about um, you know, having, um, having higher, um, higher interest rates. Um, that said, it comes with the additional cost of inflation. And I think all businesses, you're seeing inflation in your labor force, you're seeing it in raw material prices, you're seeing it in um, um, in, uh, in, you know, in operating expenses. And so I think it is, uh, this is an example where I had my management team today and said, everyone, we have to act now on expenses. We have to really rethink and replan our year to reflect higher unit costs everywhere. And, um, um, and let's, let's, let's do it sooner rather than later. We know this is a problem. We know it's not going to end. So let's get at the work uh, and let's start working on the patient uh, now versus waiting towards the, you know, towards the end of the year when you start to run out of time. This is going to be interesting to a lot of your students who haven't been in the workforce before that you have these, you know, these fiscal year ends or you have these you know, financial year ends. So you're working towards, uh, particularly as a public company, you're working towards your year end. So a big part of our effort now as a management team is replanning, reprioritizing, accepting and understanding where we're seeing inflationary pressures hit our expenses, but uh, I think it's, um, you know, obviously it's, it's hitting us in a variety of ways, but uh, on balance, the increased interest rates are a, a, a very big positive for our industry. Yeah. Like jet fuel, but more environmentally friendly. How about that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, so I'm a finance professor, so um, we, we could geek out on this for a while. <laughs> um, and I would enjoy it, certainly, as well as many of our students. But we're getting a lot of questions that are more uh, sort of about you as a leader. So I, I'm going to I'm going to shift okay. gears um, uh, once once again. And, and your bio says that you're passionate about meaningful work that makes a difference in um, people's lives, which I think is something that at Cary Business School, we, we really um, relate to. Um, you know, why is that passion important to you? And how does it translate into the business of, um, of Transamerica? You know, I mean, it, selfishly, it, it makes me feel good. Um, and it makes me uh, have more fun at work. I, I, I just personally enjoy um, knowing that, you know, we're focused on um, contributing to society, right? And so in, in, in our industry, what does that mean? It means that, you know, when we're successful designing a, a solution and success to reach a consumer, there's an American family that has protection that they ordinarily wouldn't have. That's one way that you help. Um, there's an American family that has, you know, a guaranteed uh, income in their retirement that they wouldn't have had had we not uh, been there. But what a lot of people don't realize about the insurance industry is that you cannot buy our product and you still benefit because to be commercially successful requires that we invest back into the economy through our general account. Um, we're investing in uh, one of the largest investors in long-term corporate debt, which uh, essentially is contributing to uh, business expansion, uh, contributing to innovation, contributes to workforce expansion uh, in those corporations. We invest in, uh, in government debt that can, uh, that can go and improve um, the lives of communities, whether it be a, you know, a government project of, of, of clean water or hospital system or, uh, or infrastructure, et cetera. If you, as an example, if you go back 
to um, the Obama, Obama administration when there was the, um, um, oh, it wasn't Build, not Build Back Better, but Build America bonds. Um, do you remember that? that the, the, I do. The, I, I'm, I'm struggling with the name too. The, yes, I it know. Was the, it was the shovel ready product project, right. but now I'm getting, I've got Build Back Better in my brain. Um, but in those, in that, in that issuance at the uh, Obama administration, the insurance industry was, you know, uh, three quarters of the purchasers of that debt. So an example of contributing to, uh, in a sense, infrastructure. So uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, obviously what you're seeing is I like looking for the ways that we help people. Yes, we're in the insurance business. Yes, we're here to, you know, work hard uh, and make a profit, but we're also here to be a force for good. And I think it's important. I wish at an earlier age, I would have been more curious to learn about seeing the whole value chain of how the industry or the company was making an impact. But it really, it really spoke to me when I joined the insurance industry um, after Merrill Lynch in 2000, I re rejoined the insurance industry in 2008 and began to see uh, the real societal impacts that the insurance industry has. Um, it, it, to, to, to me, it, it just makes a meaningful difference in my career to know that, um, that we're helping people. And, and I think often when, when folks um, go into the financial uh, sector, they, they may not sort of appreciate um, th those important uh, impacts. One, one of the questions we, we, we got here from an audience member is, you know, what drove you to the financial services industry and what motivated you to stick around? And th those might have been different. Maybe So maybe you could speak to, um, was it sort of the interest for what um, a finance career would be like? And then you've kind of developed a passion more deeply that, that caused you to stick around or, uh, you know, what? You know, my, um, um, I saw the impact that a financial planner had on my parents. Uh, my father was a professional, he was a dentist. Um, but he always fancied himself that he wanted to be an entrepreneur. And, um, but he was a dentist. <laughs> and so um, early on in our childhood, he, 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 he would make uh, you know, investments that wouldn't necessarily pan out. And, uh, and those were some tough and some, 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 some tight times. Uh, and, and then he got introduced to a financial planner who helped really lay out a course for how he should, he and my mother, and they really, my mother was the leader here, uh, um, and she really planned all of the, uh, all of it, um, and you know, it gave her a path to take charge, and put the family on a, a firm, more you know financial plan that was organized and disciplined, and became regular savers. And I could just see at a young age, even through high school and early college, what a difference that made. I thought, wow, that's that's kind of cool. Um, I got really interested in, um, you know, in investing co investment concepts, and it's just something that um, it really came natural to me, and I, I enjoyed it. It's nothing other than I just there was context to the math, is the way I can explain it. You know, there's just context to the math. I could see, you know, how the math was helpful to somebody, and so I started early in my career, um, really pursuing a career goal of you know wanting to be a financial planner in my hometown, and. Uh, um, through one promotion here, one promotion there, I, North Carolina boy finds himself in in New York City, which is a place I never thought I would be. <laughs> and then, um, you know, I got associated with the company Merrill Lynch, who was a company that if they saw potential in you, they would give you challenges before you're even ready for them. Um, and so I highly encourage you to look for companies that will um, you know, create uh, are open to giving opportunities and experience that are stretch assignments that and I certainly benefited from that as well. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so I, 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 I would say it was not a, um, it was, it was not a well laid plan. Um, but as I look back, it looks like it was. Um, but as I was going through it at the time, all I wanted out of college was a job. Um, I wanted a job so I could earn a paycheck and have some independence. Um, and then once I got that job, I wanted to do another job really, really well. But it wasn't um, it, 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 it wasn't a well-intentioned, you know, grand design that led from my beginning to where I am today. Well, I love that. And as, as somebody myself who who was trying to find context for math and 
went through engineering and then to finance, I totally get that piece. And, uh, but I also love uh, sort of the personal um, story as well, which, which gives us a lot of context. So there's actually a question here um, sort of related to that, which is um, what early setbacks later gave you an advantage as a leader? You know, I was, um, what a lot, you know, I, I, uh, I, I speak a lot um, in my career and I've held, held many um, kind of, you know, national or global sales roles. So interacting with people and speaking is a, a factor in that. But what a lot of people don't know about me is that I had a very debilitating stutter as a young boy, probably up until fourth or fifth grade. And um, it was, um, you know, it was, it was, it was one of those, it was one of those stutters where, um, you know, people would make fun of you, uh, including my brother. So I'd, you know, I'd go to a summer, summer camp and they would send me care packages and they'd write letters and say, you know, do, 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 will, will, will. <laughs> so it was a, uh, with that comes a lot of teasing. Um, um, and, um, and with that could come a lot of, you know, kind of a hurt self-esteem, if you will. Um, but this is a I had a very strong mother who, uh, against the school's wishes, would um, um, pull me out and uh, take me to someone that could help me um, figure out what you know, quote unquote, what was wrong with me. And uh, um, and once I learned how to, basically, what I was doing is I my mind was ahead of where my mouth was. So once I figured out how to slow down, you know, uh, it was off to the races, and I haven't stopped talking since. Um, but I, I, I think the going through the process of being teased just gave me some, it gave me a little bit of a thicker skin. Um, I, I don't, uh, you know, um, I'm, uh, I'm not a sensitive, um, to, you know, uh, remarks, I think because of that, so I got a little bit more of a thicker skin and I think it also gave me a lot of empathy of, uh, you know, maybe how, how to treat other people, um, in, in, in particular, how to help someone who's, uh, is you know even if even they're just having a bad day, right? Maybe trying to help them uh, feel a little bit better about the day. Yeah, well, thanks. Well, I really appreciate you um, sharing that story. It's great, great for folks to hear that. And um, you know, you also talked before about opportunities. That, so that's sort of the challenges in overcoming them. You also talked about how Merrill Lynch was great at spotting folks that really had a lot of potential and providing them with opportunities. Um, there's a question here that says, uh, you mentioned the importance of reaching back and opening doors uh, for others and, and responding to an earlier question. Um, is there some, someone who did that uh, for you? And can you speak yeah. to that experience? Yeah, I think I, you know, all through my life, um, teachers, coach, um, college administrator, um, and then certainly at work. Um, and it is, um, man, there's, there's just nothing better than when someone uh, that you respect um, offers attention and in particularly sees, some, sees potentially in you that you might not see in yourself. So it is, uh, for the person that's giving that energy, it may not seem like a big deal, but the person that receives that energy, it could be something they carry with them their whole life. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I think it's an important um, pay it forward uh, activity of um, and just being conscious of the impact that you can make. Um, you know, even those here uh, on the call, even though you haven't started your career, um, you know, you have, you know, you have classmates at, at John Hopkins and you have uh, former classmates um, back home towns that look up to you. Um, and you can make this throughout every stage of your life, you can make a contribution to being a force uh, for good um, to all the pe people around you. And uh, I wouldn't be where I am today if I, there's people that didn't believe in me. And um, I like to think that uh, I seek out and try to uh, repay the favor uh, in my daily life. Well, that's um, a, a great message. And, um, you know, we have quite a few um, students who are graduating on the call um, and others who are, are midway uh, through their programs. A um, couple of questions about um, developing careers in the financial services industry. So first of all, uh, just to focus on, on some of the skills uh, that they should be developing at this point, getting ready. You know, I think one is learn about the different business models and financial services, you know, first there's 
a wide range of careers um, uh, and vocations in financial services. So, you know, when I try to get exposed as many as you can, um, that'd be number one. Um, you know, number two, uh, be curious. You're going to learn a lot. There's a lot you learn in the classroom. There's a lot you learn in the classroom, but you're going to be applying that those mathematics and those concepts at work. And, you know, um, I, if I could give advice to my younger self, it would be uh, uh, if, if you're telling yourself that this work is mundane and boring, then it means you haven't asked the question to understand what the work, what's the work going to be used for um, and really get down to understanding the context of the application of the work that might uh, again, there's there's something embedded in there. The uh, next piece of advice would be seek out people that have very different skills than you. You're going to find in financial services that there is a whole ecosystem of talent and skill sets um, that will be different than yours. Seek out that seek out those that are different. You'll learn so much from just interacting with people. Um, that uh, are working in a different area or um, happen to have a, a, a different learned skill. Um, you know, if you're in the sales and relationship business, go make friends with some actuaries as an example. Um, and um, and I, I just found that that really accelerated my, uh, you know, my learning quite a bit. Great. So um, we were talking a little bit about sort of getting ready for careers, just th this a little bit um, shifting back to our discussion about uh, about the, the, the workforce um, and about how people are less likely to stay in, in one place. Um, you also talked about the benefits of offering greater flexibility to employees as an employer. Um, how, um, how have you ad uh, um, adapted to retain and attract employees to stay competitive? You know, um, I think that, um, you know, every company has a different starting point on this, on, 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 on this question. So I'll, I'll, I'll speak to ours. Um, one, we want to ask a lot of questions. We really want to understand what is it that makes you um, like your work, like your company, want to, do you see yourself staying at the company? Why, why, why? Ask a lot of why's. And there's a couple combinations we find. Um, you know, uh, one there's uh, there's a focus on flexibility. Um, there's a focus on workload. Uh, there's a big emphasis on 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 your direct manager. I've often heard people don't people don't leave companies; they leave managers. Um, so that relationship with the direct manager is, is it can be you know be pretty pretty instrumental. Um, compensation and benefits uh, is one. Um, location is another. So there's a whole host of, in a sense, drivers. And the more we can know as a company what those drivers are, the better we can position our company to be a net winner here. Um, you know, on this, I think one thing that's led to our uh, embracing flexible work and flexible scheduling, flexible locations, right, which is this notion that I want to be where the best talent wants to be. Um, and so, um, uh, that's one. Two, our corporate footprint is pretty attractive between, you know, uh, having a West Coast flag in Denver. I know it's not West Coast, but it's West of, <laughs> of East Coast. We have a Mid Coast flag. We're in Florida. We're in New York. We're in Baltimore. We're in Massachusetts. We're in Atlanta. A lot of different locations such that if people want to be mobile and they still want to be near an office, we have a, uh, an office network. That I think that helps, you know, in a sense, support that more than, you know, companies that may have um, you know, a dominant presence in, you know, let's say New York City or a dominant presence in, in uh, you know, in Chicago. Um, we're finding more and more it's workload, uh, work-life balance, is my stress manageable, and, in, and, and, and again, that, um, that manager relationship. So there's never been a more pivotal time to make an impact as a manager than right now. We, we rely so much on the manager to be the architect and the conductor of what this flexible experience looks like. So we have to really educate them, really train them and empower them and empower them to make best decisions for their team. The idea that I'm gonna issue a policy that says flexible work means this, and it's a, this very rigidly applied policy, we think is probably not the right idea. We need to create a, a framework of what flexible work means as an example and then trust and empower 
uh, our managers and leaders to bring that to life with their teams. So we're trying to be on the net positive side of the mobile work, the net positive side of the great of the great uh, resignation, and in, 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 in a place that embodies uh, where talent wants to go versus and uh, um, um, wants to go in the future. Great, great. Well, well. Uh, unfortunately, we've come to the top of the hour to the end of our time, but I just want to thank you so much for sharing insights about, about the future of work, about Transamerica, about your own personal life and, and success. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to, to be with us and to share all that. And again, uh, for all of your support for our DEIB initiatives at uh, Cary Business School as well. Alex, thank you so much for having me. We really appreciate it. And I wish everybody on the call uh, uh, great fortune in their in their education and in their career. So thank you. Thanks so much, Will. And thank you to all of our um, audience members. And um, I hope you all join us uh, next week on May 9th. Our guest will be uh, Lisa Chang, who's the Global Chief People Officer for the Coca-Cola uh, company. So everyone have a great evening. Thank you.